This is the Trident Disabilities Audio Archive Recording, Fungi, Folklore, and Fairyland, by Mike J., published October 7, 2020, read by a Trident Disabilities volunteer. From fairy rings to Lewis Carroll's Alice, mushrooms have long been entwined with the supernatural in art and literature. What might this say about past knowledge of hallucinogenic fungi? Mike J. looks at early reports of mushroom-induced trips and how one species in particular became established as a stock motive in Victorian fairyland. Below this is an image from a stage production with a m- large mushroom in the middle with a flat top and fairy tale creatures surrounded all about looking at a toad in the grass. The caption for this reads The Intruder from 1860 by John Anster Fitzgerald with the Fly Agaric Center Sage. The first recorded mushroom trip in Britain took place in London's Green Park on October 3, 1799. Like many such experiences before and since, it was accidental. A man identified in the subsequent med- medical report as J.S. was in the habit of gathering small mushrooms from the park on autumn morning and cooking them up for breakfast into a broth for his wife and young family. But this particular morning, an hour after they finished it, everything began to turn very strange. J.S. noticed black spots and odd flashes of color interrupting his vision. He became disoriented and had difficulty in standing and moving around. His family were complaining of stomach cramps and cold, numb extremities. The notion of poisonous toadstools leapt to his mind, and he staggered out into the streets to seek help. But within a hundred yards, he had forgotten where he was going or why and was found wandering in a confused state. By chance, a physician named Everard Brand was passing through this part of town, and he was summoned to treat J.S. and his family. The scene he witnessed was so unusual that he wrote it up in length and published it in the medical and physical journal a few months later. The family's symptoms were rising and falling in giddy waves. Their pupils dilated, their pulses fluttering, and their breathing labored, periodically returning to normal before accelerating into another crisis. All were fixated on the fear that they were dying, except for the youngest, the eight-year-old son named as Edward S., whose symptoms were the strangest of all. He had eaten a large portion of the mushrooms and was attacked with fits of immoderate laughter, which his parents' threats could not subdue. He seemed to have been transported into another world, from which he would only return under duress to speak nonsense. When roused and interrogated us to it, he answered indifferently, yes or no, as he did to every other question, evidently without any relation of what was asked. Dr. Brand diagnosed the family's condition as a delirious effects of a common species of agaric mushroom, not hitherto suspected to be poisonous. Today we can be more specific. This was intoxication by Liberty Caps, the magic mushrooms that grow plentifully across the hills, moors, commons, golf courses, and playing fields of Britain every autumn. The botanical illustrator James Sorbury, who was working on the third volume of his landmark, Colored Figures of English Fungi or Mushrooms, 1803, interrupted his schedule to visit J.S. and identify the species in question. Sourby's illustration includes a cluster of unmistakable liberty caps, together with a similar-looking species, now recognized as roundhead, of the Stropharia genus. In his accompanying note, Sourby emphasizes that it was the pointy-headed variety, with the pileus accumulated, that nearly proved fatal to a poor family in Piccadilly, London, who were so indiscreet as to stew a quantity for breakfast. Below this is a picture from James Sowerby's Colored Figures of English Fungi or Mushrooms from 1803, and the mushrooms are numbered 1, 2, and 3, as liberty caps, all standing. Brand's account for the J.S. family episode continued to be cited in Victorian drug literature for decades, Yet the 19th century would come and go without any clear identification of the Liberty Cap as hallucinogenic. The psychedelic compound that had caused the mysterious derangement remained unknown until the 1950s, when Albert Hoffman, the Swiss chemist who discovered discovered LSD, turned his attention to the hallucinogenic mushrooms in Mexico. Psilocybin, LSD's chemical cousin, was finally isolated from mushrooms in 1958 synthesized in a Swiss lab- laboratory in, fi- in 1959 and identified as a Liberty Cap in 1963. 
During the 19th century, the Liberty Cap took on a different set of associations, derived not from its visionary properties, but its distinctive appearance. Samuel Taylor Coleridge seemed to have been the first to suggest its common name in a short piece published in 1812 in Omniana, a miscellany co-written with Robert South Southey. Coleridge was struck by the common fungus which so exactly represents the pole and cap of liberty that it seems offered by nature herself as the appropriate emblem of Gallic republicanism. The cap of liberty, or figurian cap, a peaked felt bonnet associated with the similar-looking pileus worn by freed slaves in the Roman Empire, had become an iconic political freedom through the revolutionary movements of the 17th and 18th centuries. William of Orange included it as a symbol on a coin struck to celebrate his glorious revolution in 1688. The anti-monarchist M.P. John Wilkes holds it mounted on its pole in William Hogarth's devilish caricature of 1763. It appears on a medal designed by Benjamin Franklin to commemorate July 4th, 1776, under the banner Libertas Americana and it was adopted during the French Revolution by the sans culottes as their signature bonnet rouge. It was these associations, rather than its psychoactive properties, of which he shows no knowledge, that led Coleridge to celebrate it as the Mushroom Cap of Liberty, a name that percolated through the many reprints of Omnianania into 19th century British culture, folklore, and botany. Below this is two images, the left one being Benjamin Franklin's commemorative medal, Libertas Americana, with a woman in the middle with a liberty cap in her hair, sourced as in 1782. On the right is William Hogarth's 1763 caricature of John Wilkes with pole and cap of liberty. And in this picture, the cap of liberty is strode over John Wilkes' shoulder as he sits in a tall chair. While the Liberty Cap's magic properties seem to go largely unacknowledged, the idea that fungi could provoke hallucinations did begin to percolate more widely in Europe during the 19th century, though it became attached to quite different species of mushroom. In parallel to a growing scientific interest in toxic and hallucinogenic fungi, a vast body of Victorian folklore connected mushrooms and toadstools with elves, pixies, hollows, hills, in the unwitting transport of subjects to fairyland, a world of shifting perspectives, seething with elemental spirits. The similarity of this other world to these endangered by plant psychedelics and new world cultures, where psilocybin contains mushrooms that could be used for millennia, is suggestive. It is possible that the Victorian fairy tradition, beneath its innocent exterior, operated as a conduit for a hidden tradition of psychedelic knowledge. Were the authors of this fantastical narrative, Alice in Wonderland, for example, aware of the powers of certain mushrooms to lead unsuspecting visitors to enchanted lands? Were they perhaps even writing from personal experience? The J.S. family strip in 1799 is a useful starting point for such inquiries. It shows liberty caps were growing in Britain at the time and commonplace even in London parks. But also the trip evidences that the mushrooms hallucinogenic effects were unfamiliar, perhaps even unheard of, certainly unusual enough for a London physician to draw them to the attention of his learned colleagues. At the same time, however, scholars and naturalists were becoming more aware of the widespread use of plant intoxicants in non-Western cultures. In 1762, Carl Linnaeus, the great taxonomist and the father of Mott and Botany, compiled the first ever list of intoxicating plants, a monograph entitled Anna Britannia, which assembled a golden pharmacopoeia that extended from Europe, including opium and henbane, to the Middle East, including hashish and datura, South America, which included coca leaf, and Asia, which included betel nut, and the Pacific kava. The study of such plants were, was emerging from the margins of classical studies, ethnography, folklore, and medicine to become a subject in its own right. The interest in traditional cultures extended to European folklore. A new generation of folklore collectors, such as the Brothers Grimm, realized that the migration of peasant populations to the city was dismantling centuries of folklore stories, songs, and oral histories with alarming rapidity. In Britain, Robert Southey 
was a prominent collector of vanishing folk traditions, soliciting and publishing examples offered by his readers. The Victorian fairy tradition, as it emerged, was imbued with a romantic sensibility in which rustic traditions were no longer coarse and backward, but picturesque and semi-sacred, an escape from the industrial modernity of an ancient, often pagan land of enchantment. The subject lent itself to writers and artists who, under the guise of innocence, were able to explore sensual and erotic themes with boldness off-limits in more realistic genres and to reimagine the muddy and impoverished countryside through the prism of classical and Shakespearean scenes of playful nature spirits. The lore of plants and flowers was carefully curated and woven into supernatural tapestries of flower fairies and enchanted woods, and mushrooms and toadstools popped up everywhere. Fairy rings and toadstool-dwelling elves were recycled through a Victorian culture of motif and decoration until they became emblematic of fairyland itself. Below is an illustration by Richard Doyle from his In Fairyland, a series of pictures from the elf world in 1870, and it includes an elf and a fairy running around a mushroom, seeming to play hide-and-seek. The magical allure marked a shift from previous depictions of Britain's fungi. In herbals and medical texts from the Renaissance onward, they had typically been associated with rot, dung heaps, and poison. The new generation of folklorists, however, followed Coleric in an appreciative and appreciating them. Thomas Knightley, who surveyed the fairy mythology 1850, exerted much influence on the fictional fairy tradition, gives Welsh and Gaelic examples of traditional names for fungi, which involve, invoke elves and puck. In Ireland, the Gaelic slang for mushrooms is pookies which Kitely associated with the elemental nature spirit puka, hence puck. It's a term that persists in eyeless drug culture today, although evident for pre-modern Gaelic magic mushrooms, use remains elusive. At one point, Kitely refers to those pretty small delicate fungi with their conical heads, which are named fairy mushrooms in Ireland, where they grow so plentifully. This seems to describe the liberty cap, though Kitely, like Coleridge, focuses on the physical experience, experience of the mushroom and appears unaware of its psychedelic properties. Despite its ubiquity and occasional tentative association with nature spirits, the mushroom that became the distinctive motive of fairyland was not the liberty cap, but rather the spectacular red and white fly agaric. The fly agaric is psychoactive, but unlike the liberty cap, which delivers psilocybin, in relative doses, it contains a mix of alkaloids, muscarin, muscimol, ibotenic acid, which generates an unpredictable and toxic cocktail of effects. These can include wooziness and disorientation, drooling, sweats, numbness of the lips and extremities, nausea, muscle twitches, sleep, and a vague, often retrospective sense of liminal consciousness and waking dreams. At lower doses, none of these may manifest. As higher doses, they may lead to comas or, on rare occasion, death. Below this is a watercolor depiction of the fly agaric from 1892, likely painted at an art class near Bristol, England. The writing says Agaricus muscarius in Lee Woods, September 92. The picture depicts two of these mushrooms, the one on the left being closed with one little hole on the side and the other one being open and more natural looking. Unlike the Liberty Cap, the fly agaric is hard to ignore or misidentify, and its toxicity has been well established for centuries. Its name derives from its ability to kill flies. One could argue then that this aura of livid beauty and danger would alone be enough to explain its association with the otherworldly realm of fairies. Yet at the same time, its mind-altering effects were becoming more widely known not from any rustic tradition in Britain, but from the discovery that it was used as an intoxicant among the remote peoples of, I of Siberia. Sporadically through the 18th century, Swedish and Russian explorers had returned from Siberia with travelers' tales of shamans, spirit possession, and self-poisoning with brightly colored toadstools. But it was a Polish traveler named Joseph Kopek who was the first to write an account of his first-hand experience with the fly at Garrick, which appeared in 1837 publication of his travel diary. In around 
1797, after he had been living in Kamchata for two years, Kopek was taken ill with a fever and was told by a local of the miraculous mushroom that could cure him. He ate half a fly of garrick and fell into a vivid fever dream. As though magnetized, he was drawn through the most attractive gardens, where only pleasure and beauty seemed to rule. Beautiful women, dressed in white, fed him with fruits, berries, and flowers. He woke after a long and healing sleep and took a second, stronger dose, which precipitated him back into slumber, in the sense of an epic voyage into another world. He relived swaths of his childhood, re-encountered friends from throughout his life, and even predicted the future at length with such confidence that a priest was summoned to witness. He concluded with a challenge to science. If someone can prove that both the effect and the influence of the mushroom are non-existent, then I shall stop being defender of the miraculous mushroom of Kamchatka. Below this are two illustrations, the first one being of a Siberian and Viki shaman from Nicholas's Whitson's Nord and Oost Tarte. And it includes a shaman, shirtless, wearing a skirt, banging on a drum, with antlers on his head, and teepees in the background. The next is illustrations by Ivan Biblobin from the 19, 1899 edition of the Russian fairy tale, Vasila the Beautiful. On the left, we see the supernatural be being Baba Yaga, the ground strewn with fly agarics, and on the right, the heroine, Vasila outside Baba Yaga's hut, the border decorated predominantly with liberty caps and what looks to be fly agarics. Kopek's toadstool epiphany was one of several descriptions of fly agaric use by Siberian peoples that were widely reported in various learning journals and popular works throughout Europe in the late 18th and 19th centuries. Such accounts began a fashion for re-examining elements of European folklore and culture and interpolating fly agaric intoxication into odd corners of myth and tradition. This is the source of the notion that the berserkers, the Viking shock stroops, of the 8th and 10th centuries drank a fly agaric potion before going into battle and fighting like men possessed, regularly asserted not only among mushroom and viking aficionados, but also in textbooks and encyclopedias. There is, however, no reference to fly agaric or indeed to any exotic plant stimulants in the sagas or eddas. The theory of mushroom intoxicated berserker warriors was first suggested by the Swedish possessor Professor Samuel Odman, in his attempt to explain the berserk raging of ancient Nordic warriors through natural history in 1784, a speculation based on the 18th century reports from Siberia. By the mid 19th century, then, the fly agaric had become synonymous with fairyland. The mushroom had also, in the guise of the Siberian sources, been claimed as a portal to the land of dreams and written into European folklore. Exactly to what extent and in what manner these two cultural journeys of the fly agaric are intertwined is hard to pin down. Long before the Siberian accounts, in both art and literature, mushrooms of all sorts are depicted as part of fairyland. In Margaret Cavendish's mid-17th century poem, The Pastime of the Queen of Fairies, a mushroom acts as Queen Mab's dining table. And in late 18th century paintings by Henry Fuseli and Joshua Reynolds, the mushroom acts as a surface, upon which fairies, sprites, and similar assemble. Such a presence of mushrooms in supernatural worlds might suggest a concealed or half-forgotten knowledge of hallucinogenic mushrooms in British culture. However, these fungi do not resemble fly agaric or any other hallucinogenic mushroom. And of course, for small woodland creatures, in the large display of the mushroom would seem like a natural furniture. It's only in the Victorian era, post-Siberian tales, that a hallucinogenic mushroom establishes itself so firmly in Britain as the stock mushroom of fairyland. Below this is two images, the first one being Titania's Awakening from 1785 by Henry Fuseli that includes many creatures surrounding each other with a woman naked in the middle. Below this is a gnome transporting a fly agaric mushroom from a German New Year's card from 1900. Let us turn now to the most famous and frequently debated conjunction of fungi, psychedelia and folklore. The array of mushrooms and hallucinatory potions, mind-bending and shape-shifting modus, 
in the Alice in Wonderlands, 1865. The Alice's adventures represent first-hand knowledge of hallucinogenic mushrooms. The scenes in question could hardly be better known. Alice down the rabbit hole meets a caterpillar sitting on a mushroom, who tells her in a languid, sleepy voice that the mushroom is the key to navigating through her strange journey. One side will make you go taller, the other side will make you go shorter. Alice takes a chunk from each side of the mushroom and begins a series of vertinicus transformations of size, shooting up into the clouds before learning to maintain her normal size by eating alternate bites. Throughout the rest of the book, she continues to take the mushroom, entering the house of Duchess, approaching the domain of the March Hare, and climatically before entering the hidden garden with the golden key. Below this is the original illustration of Lewis Carroll's The Caterpillar Scene from his original manuscript of the story. There is nothing here to suggest it may have been Fly at Garrick. Since the 1960s, this has often been read as an initiatic work of drug literature, an esoteric guide to the other worlds opened up by psychedelics, most memorably perhaps in Jefferson Airplane's psychedelic anthem, White Rabbit, 1967 which conjures Alice's journey as a, self pa- as a path of self-discovery, where the stale advice of parents is transcended by the guidance received from within, by feeding your head. This reading is often dismissed by Lewis Carroll's scholars, but medication and unusual states of consciousness certainly exercise a profound fascination for Carroll, and he read about them voraciously. His interest was spurred by his own delicate health, insomnia and frequent migraines, which he treated with homeopathic remedies, including many derived from psychoactive plants, such as aconite and belladonna. His library included books of homeopathy as well, as texts that discussed mind, discussed mind-altering drugs, including F.E. Ansi's Thoreau Compendium, Stimulants and Narcotics from 1864. He was greatly intrigued by the epileptic seizure of an Oxford student, at which he was present, and in 1857, visited St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London in order to witness chloroformic anesthesia, a novel procedure that had come to public attention four years previously when it was administered to Queen Victoria during childbirth. Nevertheless, it seems unlikely that Alice's mind-expanding journeys owed anything to the actual drug experience, experiences of its author. Although Carol, in daily life, the Reverend Charles Doxton, was a moderate drinker and, as to by, judged by his library, opposed to alcohol prohibition. He had a strong dislike of tobacco smoking and wrote skeptically in his letters about the pervasive prevalence of syrups and soothing tonics of powerful narcotics like opium. The medicine so dexterously but ineffectually concealed in the jam of our early childhood. Yet Alice's adventures may have had their roots in a psychedelic mushroom experience. The scholar Michael Carmichael has demonstrated that a few days before he began writing the story, Carroll made his only ever visit to Oxford's Bodleian Library, where a copy of Mordecai Cook's recently published drug survey, The Seven Sisters of Sleep, from 1860, had been deposited. The Bodleian copy of this book still has most of its pages uncut, with the exception of the contents page in the chapter of the fly Agaric, entitled The Exile of Siberia. Carroll was particularly interested in Russia, it was the only country he ever visited outside Britain. And as Carmichael puts it, Carol would have been immediately attracted to Cook's seven sisters of sleep for two more obvious reasons. He had seven sisters and he was a lifelong insomniac. Below this is a picture of gnomes transporting a fly agaric mushroom from a German's New Year, New Year card from 1900. Cook's chapter in Fly Agaric, like the rest of his book, a valuable source of the drug war, that was familiar to his generation of Victorians. It refers to Everin Brand's account of the J.S. family and rounds up various Siberian descriptions of fly Garrick experiences, including details that appear in Alice's adventures. Erroneous impressions of size and distance are common occurrences. Cook records of the fly Garrick. A straw lying in the road becomes a formidable object, to overcome which a leap is taken sufficient to clear a barrel of ale or the prostrate trunk of a British oak. The p- hypothesis is suggestive, though as it's distant of time, it's impossible to know for certain whether or not Carol read this Bodelian copy, 
or indeed any other copy of Cook's book. May be that Carol encountered a Siberian fly at Garrick Reportage elsewhere. We know, for example, that he owned a copy of James F. Johnson's The Chemistry of Common Life from 1854, which includes mention of fly at Garrick and size dilutions, or it may be that he simply drew on the fertile resources of his imagination. But some contact with widely reported Siberian cases does seem much more likely than the idea that Carroll drew on any hidden British tradition of magic mushroom use, let alone the author's own. If so, he was neither a secret drug addict initiative nor a Victorian gentleman entirely innocent of the arcane knowledge of drugs. In this sense, Alice's other world experience seemed to hover, like much of the Victorian fairy literature and fantasy, in a borderland between naive innocence of such drugs and knowing references to them. We read them today from a very different vantage point, one of which magic mushrooms are consumed far more widely than in the Victorian or indeed any previous era. In our thriving psychedelic culture, Fly Garrick is only to be encountered at the distant margins. By contrast, psilocybin mushrooms are a global phenomenon, grown and consumed in virtually every country on earth, and even making inroads into clinical psychotherapy. Today, the liberty cap is an emblem of a new political structure, the right to cognitive liberty, the free and legal altercation of one's own consciousness.